I want to talk about the concept of innovation. Now, we're all familiar with the concept of innovation. You know, products get better, new products get offered. But we generally just consider that as a, a standard thing that happens, right? Product gets better, the iPhone gets better, the computer gets better. But Clayton Christensen, in 1997, published a book called The Innovator's Dilemma, in which he discussed two different types of innovation sustaining and disruptive. And it's important to distinguish between these two because they have different implications for strategy as well as for identifying investment opportunities. Now, what's a sustaining innovation? Sustaining innovations tend to maintain a rate of improvement that gives the customer something more or better in the attributes they already value. For example, when you buy a computer, if it has a faster processor, that's a sustaining innovation, right? It ran at you know, 1.5 gigahertz, now it runs at 2.2 gigahertz. It's a faster computer, right? That's a sustaining innovation. That's something you like, right? You're, you're used to using a computer. It runs a little bit faster, okay? That's an attribute the customers like and appreciate, and that's what we call sustaining innovation. Disruptive innovations are different because they introduce a very different package of attributes from the one mainstream customers historically value. And it may be the case they may also perform worse along one or two dimensions that customers consider important. Mainstream, mainstream customers are unwilling to use these disruptive innovations simply because they are worse along dimensions that they consider important. You know, imagine buying a computer that was actually slower, that didn't perform as well as the other type of computer. You might not be interested in that. But the problem or the thing about disruptive innovations is they tend to make possible the emergence of new markets. For example, Sony's early transistor radios. Uh, they sacrificed sound, but they allowed for portability. Now, if you've seen movies from, you know, people during the 1940s or 1930s, they're always sitting around, the family is always sitting around the living room listening to the radio, perhaps listening to the news about World War II on one of these great big radios. And when Sony introduced their transistor radio, it did not sound good. So the, the dimension that people usually cared about Okay, the, the value they cared about was sound quality, and these didn't sound good. So many people weren't interested in them. Many other com companies weren't interested in making them because their customers didn't want them. But what did Sony find? Sony found that, gee, there are people, you know, young people who want to carry around their music with them, be able to take it to the beach or to the park. Uh, people who like to listen to baseball games can take their portable transistor radio again to the park or wherever they go to listen to the ball game. So even though the sound quality was worse, the, the um, dimension that added value was the portability. Now, a good industry to look at for examining sustaining and disruptive technologies is the hard drive industry, hard disk drive industry. And that's what Clayton Christensen analyzed, I believe, in his doctoral dissertation at Harvard, and which he published a number of papers on. Now, a sustaining innovation in hard drives would be faster seat times, greater drive capacities. Um, you know, hard drives just keep getting bigger and bigger. My first hard drive, when I bought my first computer, was 30 megabytes. And if, you, if you're familiar with size, the size of things, an average file song is probably about four megabytes. So you're talking about a hard drive that would hold seven or eight songs. You know, today, if you buy a laptop computer, you'll probably get, at a minimum, even the cheapest laptop computer is probably going to have 300 gigabytes of storage. And that's 10,000 times bigger. So you can see how, you know, that's a sustaining innovation, greater drive capacity. Okay, The hard drives spin faster so they read and write quicker. 
What's a disruptive innovation in the hard drive industry? Smaller physical sized hard drives. Now initially they were slower, they spun slower so they, the read and write rate was not as good and they had smaller capacities so they didn't hold as much information. But they were disruptive because the new slower smaller capacity hard drives were not what the hard drive makers customers valued. But smaller drives provided value on a different dimension, the size dimension. And the new te technology allows for smaller computers. So we went from mainframe computers to mini computers to personal computers to notebook computers and even to the original iPod. The original iPod, and they still make an iPod classic, had a small hard drive in it. Now you can't have a small iPod music player if the hard drive is, you know, three and a half inches or five and a quarter inches in size. It has to be a very, very small hard drive. And here's a graph that sort of shows you how this works. For example, in the when there were mainframe computers, this green line denotes the the capacity that's demanded by mainframe users. And there were 14 inch drives and this red line here shows the capacity of 14 inch hard drives. And you can see that it's here it's in 1974 it's equal to what they demand and then it's actually bigger than what they demand. So there's no reason for them to they're they're happy to use 14 inch hard drives in their mainframe. But when the 8 inch hard drive comes out, what do you see? The capacity is well below what mainframe users demand. So they're not interested in it. So companies that made hard drives are going to say, there's no reason for us to make 8 inch hard drives. Our mainframe customers don't want them. However, this is the point where uh, hard drives invade mini computers. It allows mini computers to be made and this green line shows the demand that mini computer uh, manufacturers needed in terms of hard drive capacity and this was above it. You also notice that this line is steeper so at some point the 8 inch hard drive is actually going to have sufficient capacity even for a mainframe computer. Now that was quite a few years down the road but that's the case. Okay? Likewise when the five and a quarter inch hard drive came about. Capacity was too small for what uh, many computers wanted or needed, but it allowed for the introduction of the PC market. And again, the demand or the capacity here is greater than what's really needed in the PC market at this point in time. Okay, And then likewise with the three and a half inch. And you'll notice that all of these are a bit steeper so they, so at some point they get better faster. So it's not good enough now, but it'll be good enough at some point in the future. And oftentimes businesses are rather short-sighted in saying, look, the product's not very good, my customers don't want it, but they may want it sometime down the road. And what happens is, is small emerging companies that are, for example, making these smaller hard drives wind up overtaking the companies that only make the larger hard drives. So one way to assess disruptive technologies is on a graph like this. So down here we have time and here we have performance and the performance measure might be speed, it might be capacity, okay, however you're measuring performance. And this red line indicates the performance improvement required by the mainstream market. However, the disruptive technology starts out here, it's not very good. Okay, this is the current performance. It's well below what the mainstream market requires. But it gets better, and it gets better at a faster rate. And at some point, it's good enough. And in fact, at some point, it exceeds what the mainstream market needs. So if you can recognize a product that's not very good, but will get better. I remember reading Andy Grove's book, um, Only the Paranoid Survive. <clears throat> Andy Grove being the uh, former CEO of Intel talking about when he was first introduced to the internet and it was terrible it was very slow I remember using a dial-up modem it was very very slow it wasn't very interesting but he asked himself what's it going to be like when it gets faster when it gets twice as fast 
five times as fast, 10 times as fast, 100 times as fast. What will we be able to do with it? So instead of ignoring it, he recognized that at some point this is going to be an important um, industry, okay? Or, you know, the and products that, that service the internet are going to be important too. You can see that it's going to get better faster and at some point this is going to be a disruptive technology. Now, disruptive innovations often allow new firms to overtake incumbent firms. So, if you're an investor, it's an opportunity to perhaps spot a new firm that may, uh, may be the next Google, okay, or the next Microsoft, etc. Um, one of the questions is, why don't the incumbents just invest in the disruptive technologies? Well, they find that the improvements aren't what their customers value. They may also be afraid that the new technologies will cannibalize their core business. A good example of that is Kodak. Kodak, the film company, okay, that's how they made all their money, they actually invented the digital camera. All right, and now the digital camera has, has, has forced them into bankruptcy. Nobody buys film anymore. Um, they invented it, but they didn't think it wasn't very good but they didn't ask themselves what would it be like when it gets better. They were also afraid that if they, if they pushed the digital camera, it would hurt their core business of selling, selling film. Now, some firms do a good job of trying to disrupt their own business by, for example, setting up a skunk works operation. And they do that by essentially sending, uh, sending a group of people off on their own to work on their own projects, sort of away from the corporate culture. So they're not worried about what the core business is, they just try and invent something that, that may or may not pan out. Um, companies like 3M and Google uh, give their employees work time to actually work on anything they want. Uh, a couple of these places, I think Google, you have to spend 20% of your time working on something else. Now, these are highly motivated people, so these aren't people who are going to take 20% of their time to goof off. They're going to work on something they think is an interesting product. And it may have nothing to do with Google, but Google may look down the road and say, wow, we can commercialize that. And so it'll actually disrupt their business. Um, another thing that incumbents sometimes do is they'll purchase a disruptive technology from another firm, or they'll actually purchase the other firm. So a lot of times you'll hear about, larger companies um, purchasing these small companies that have these new technologies. So disruption is an interesting thing to look at. And so when you see innovation, you may see you have to distinguish between whether it's, it's sustaining or disruptive. And it's just, if it's disruptive, it may be an opportunity for an investment if you happen to want to buy the stock of the company or it may be, if you happen to be in the corporate world, it may be valuable to consider buying that company or investing in that technology.